If you have your Bible with you, would you just do it one more time? Stand up one more time if you can. And just if you have a Bible, take it and lift it up. And let's begin by thanking God for the gift of his word. Father, we bless and thank you this day. We thank you as we celebrate the greatest gift of all, Jesus coming into this world. We pray, Father, that in the midst of all of the hustle and bustle of this time of year, that, Father, we would be able to focus in this moment on you and the gift of the Word of God. Father, we pray that as we study the Word today, you open our eyes to see and that, Jesus, you would give us a miracle in the middle of our messes. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Turn to somebody before you're seated. Whoop, whoop, oh, stand up. Turn to somebody before you seat and just tell them God has a miracle for your mess, and then you can sit down. There you go. All right. Praise the Lord. Well, if you have your Bible with you this morning, you can open it up to the Gospel of John and the ninth chapter, John chapter 9. And uh, this morning, we're going to continue to take a look at this wonderful statement that Jesus made, that he was the light of the world. Now, the name of my message this morning, if you haven't figured it out, is real simple, and that is this, seeing the miracle in our messes. We've got to learn to see the miracle in our messes, and we're going to see this from the life of Jesus. In John chapter 9, Jesus just finished a very tense conversation with the most religious people of his day. Jesus had been expressing the life and the love of God, doing miracles, ministering to people, multiplying food for those that were hungry. And you know, sometimes when you start to walk in the power of God and express the love of God in a way that the the establishment doesn't get and doesn't understand, especially sometimes established religion. If religion doesn't understand you, very often it will oppose you. And the fact is that Jesus was being opposed. And we just saw in the eighth chapter of John that Jesus got up in the middle of a giant Jewish festival and declared that he was the meaning of that festival, that he was the source of living water. And it brought Jesus into a big conversation and actually a debate with the religious leaders, the Pharisees. And at the end of that debate, Jesus expressed that he was the light of the world. And by the time they were done, those leaders were ready to take Jesus' life. They picked up stones to kill Jesus. And Jesus slipped away from the midst of that trap. And chapter 9 picks up right after Jesus leaves that moment. Jesus had been confronting the people who said that they had the truth, had the light, had the, had the ability to see right and wrong, and Jesus had just exposed the blindness of these very devout religious people. Jesus had been confronted. They'd brought before Jesus a woman that they had, uh, they had caught in the middle of adultery, and they were accusing her, wanting her to be stoned, and Jesus said an amazing thing. He said, if you don't have sin, you can go ahead and stone her. And of course, everyone there had sin, so no one was able to stone her. Jesus is making a point. And that point that Jesus is making in John chapter 7, 8, and 9 is that we all are in some way broken, bruised, and blind. And we need Jesus to open our hearts. We need Jesus in our lives. No matter how religious we are or how broken we are, Jesus is the answer that we need. So Jesus slips out of the temple, and as he leaves, he's walking along, and we're going to see that Jesus has an encounter that illustrates that he is the light of the world. Let's begin reading in John chapter 9 and verse 1. The Bible says, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him and said, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, because the night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he had said these things, 
he spat on the ground and made clay with his saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And then he said to him, go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which, when it's translated, means the pool called to be sent. So he went and washed, and when he came back, he was seeing. He was seeing. What an interesting experience. Now, this whole ninth chapter is devoted to this one event. And what happens after this miracle is really interesting because, again, Jesus gets into it with the religious leaders of the day. But Jesus is doing something that's so powerful. He's revealing that everyone needs his touch, his light, his life. So let's take a look at this and begin to unpack this. First of all, Jesus healing a blind man was really significant. And if you continue to read in the ninth chapter, you'll see that that they just couldn't quite get their heads around how a man who was born blind could have a miracle in his life. And and they were hung up on the fact that the miracle was performed on the Sabbath. In other words, they weren't excited that this guy had a miracle. They were upset that it wasn't the way that their religion said it should be experienced. In other words, he shouldn't be healing someone on, on this very sacred holy day. And they missed the fact that God, who gave them that day, was present with them in the life of Jesus doing a miracle. How often do we get hung up on our religious ideas that we can't see past our traditions that God is at work in the middle of our lives? And this is what Jesus is saying. He wants us to see him in spite of the problems that we have in life. Now, as they're walking out of this temple, remember, it was a very tense scene. Jesus was just about killed. And he's going with his disciples, and no doubt they were, they were feeling the, the uh, tension of that moment. And as they walked by, probably just out of the temple, where people often would be laid to beg, and those who were lame, those who were, who were bruised, those who were broken by life, were often reaching out and begging. And the Bible says later that this man was a beggar, so he was impoverished. He, di- he wasn't able to work. He was depending on other people for handouts. And Jesus walks by this man, and his disciples begin the event. They notice the man, and they ask him a theological question. Now, what's amazing is they didn't see a man who had a need that God wanted to heal. They just saw a man who had a pain, had a problem, had a brokenness, and they wanted to know where did this come from. And the first thing we need to realize is this. If we're going to get God involved in our problems, in our messes, in our challenges, in our brokenness, we've got to get over the blame game. Turn to somebody and say the blame game. The blame game is, why does this happen? Why did this happen to me? Why am I suffering? Where did this come from? You know, all of us in life, at one point or another, are going to experience suffering. We're going to experience pain. We're going to go through incredibly difficult moments, moments that really we don't understand where it came from. And in that day, there was a very commonly held religious idea that if a person was born with some kind of a sickness, malady, uh, a paralysis of some sort, that it was because something had happened, and this was sort of like, although they wouldn't use the term karma, it was sort of like the outworking of someone's sin. And it was rooted in an idea that was expressed in the Old Testament. When God gave the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, God told the people, don't worship other gods, worship me only. Because if you worship other gods, if you walk away from my love and my life, and you go after other gods, then those sins will be visited not only in your life, but on your children and your children's children to the third and the fourth generation. And so what God was saying was this, when we walk away from him, we open our lives up to evil. We open our lives up to problems and to suffering. And he was simply saying that when you do that, that can not only impact you, it can impact your children and your family for generations. But somehow the religious leaders of that day had taken that statement and said that every person who's born with a physical malady or a curse was born that way because their parents had done something wrong or that perhaps God knew that they would do something wrong and therefore they were cursed with that particular problem or suffering. In other words, uh, 
and rather than seeing a person in pain, they saw a person who was probably guilty of something, and that's the reason they were suffering. So the disciples were just looking at this guy and saying, you know, where did this come from? This guy is sitting here every day. He's begging. He's blind. He's impoverished. Uh, so who opened the door for this? Was it his mom and dad? Now, think about this, because later in the chapter, his parents are actually going to be introduced and you've got to imagine what it would be like to grow up in a culture that believes that if you're born blind or lame or with some kind of a physical malady, it's because your family had done something wrong. So his parents had to live under the shame of that kind of religious idea. They had to live under the shame continuously that the reason their son was blind, the reason their son could, wouldn't be able to get a job, or wouldn't be able to work, and wouldn't be able to, to thrive was because they had done something wrong. They had to go to synagogue and, and experience the whisperings. And you know, sometimes in life, when we go through a suffering or a difficult period or we're in a painful situation, often we start asking ourselves, where did this come from? Why is this happening to me? And sometimes, you know, people, and I'm going to be honest with you, sometimes it's unfortunate, but people who claim to know God, religious people, can be the worst at condemning people who are suffering. Well, they're suffering because... And somehow we think that if we know the reason, if we, can, if we can place blame for someone's pain, then somehow it means that, you know, it won't happen to us. I mean, they, they somehow had to deserve what happened to them. And I want to just be clear about something. Sometimes bad things happen in our lives because we make really bad choices. Can we admit that? I mean, there is such a thing as right and wrong. There is such a thing as sin. And the fact is, when we do something that's, that's wrong, which, that's sinful, that's hurtful, uh, the reality is we're going to experience some consequences for that, right? I mean, God said that that can often be the source, but I want to say this to you. Not everything that happens in our life that is wrong or bad is a result of something we have done or that our family has done. The reality is we live in a broken world, and there is suffering and there is pain in the world around us. And sometimes suffering comes into our lives not because of anything that we did particularly wrong. I, and, and what we need to realize, it's not so important about where did this come from. I mean, it's good for us to examine if there's something in our life that is hurtful. You know, did I do something to contribute to this so we can learn from it? But God is not interested in us living under condemnation or living in permanent pain for the rest of our lives because of some mistake that was made by us or by someone else. God is not as concerned about that as he is about us looking to him and for him to do a miracle in the middle of our problem, in the middle of our pain. He wants to do a miracle in our mess. That's the focus we need to have not who's responsible, who's guilty. Amen. I'm reminded of the story in the Old Testament of Joseph. How many of you remember Joseph or if you've heard the story? There was 12 sons and Joseph was the youngest favorite son of his dad. And his dad treated him with just absolute love and affection. And the older brothers were jealous. So, so they one day took Joseph and they beat him up and they threw him in a pit. And when some slave traders came by, they sold him into slavery. And then they lied to their father and said a wild animal killed him. And this kid is sold into slavery and spends the majority of his teenage years and all of his 20s and into his 30s living in the pain of his brother's choices. First, he was a slave. And then as he began to, to focus on doing what was right and, being, and just, just living in God's favor, God promotes him to be the, the head of all the servants in the house. And then once again, uh, the, the, the wife of the, of the slave master comes on to him and he resists her, her uh, attempts to, to, uh, to, you know, get it on. And, and, and he runs out the door and then... The Bible says that she cries out and says that he tried to come on to her. And so he's arrested and thrown into prison. I mean, this is the second time he's really given the short end of the stick. He's given the shaft. And then he's in prison, and he begins to just trust God. And the thing that's amazing about the story of Joseph is all of the suffering, Joseph is not indicated to have done anything to deserve it. All he does is live in the favor of God. All he does is just try to be, you know, love God and, and, and focus on his future. And so he begins to rise up in the prison, and he becomes the, the most trusted guy in prison. I mean, he's in prison, but at least, you know, he's rising up. And, and what, what's amazing is while he's in prison, God begins begins to move through his gifts and through this amazing moment 
And he's in his, I mean, Joseph has been living in this suffering for, for decades. Joseph is put supernaturally into the palace of the Pharaoh, the king of the largest and most powerful empire of the world at that time. And he becomes second in command. And just as God rewards Joseph, his brothers are in famine and come to Egypt to buy grain. And Joseph, they didn't recognize because he's decked out in his finest Egyptian apparel. He's full grown. He's in his 40s. And he looks out, and there's his brothers. And when he was a young teenager, they beat him and sold him into prison. I mean, what a moment for Joseph to, you know, do a dance in the end zone. You know what I'm saying? I mean, what a moment for him to just stick it in their eye. And the reality is Joseph went out of the room, and he wept before God. And without telling you all the story, you read all about it in the book of Genesis. The Bible says that Joseph finally reveals himself to his brothers. And his brothers weep and they repent. And here's what Joseph says. It's the most amazing statement. He says, listen, don't feel bad. I mean, think about it. These guys had made him suffer for 20 years. He said, don't feel bad because even though you intended it for evil, God intended it for good. Now, what does that mean? Did God make his brothers do that? No. God doesn't send evil, but God can use evil. And because Joseph kept a positive attitude, because Joseph focused on the future, because Joseph refused to curse God and to get obsessed about why this is happening to him, he just lived in the moment and kept trusting God. He kept rising up, and he'd get knocked down, and he'd rise up, and he got knocked down, and he finally rose up. And when finally he has a moment to, to celebrate and to bring revenge, he says, listen, even though your purpose was evil towards me, God had a purpose that was good. See, God doesn't send everything that we suffer with in life, but he can use everything that happens to us in life because he's got a plan. So Jesus said to the disciples about this blind man, it wasn't his sin or his parents' sin that he should be born blind. And then he said, but that the works of God should be made manifest or revealed in him I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. Now, that's interesting. You could almost read it this way, that Jesus is saying, he's not blind because of his sin or his parents' sin. He's blind because God made him blind so God could heal him. That's actually not really what he's saying. I mean, think about it. God made him blind. Jesus didn't really say that. In fact, in the Greek, uh, there's no punctuation. So really, it's a separate statement. What Jesus is saying is this. Listen, guys, it's this, his, his blindness is not about his sin or his parents' sin. Don't get hung up about where it, the suffering or the pain or the mess is coming from. Here's what you need to know. That I have been sent to do the works of God. Now, if the works of God were to make him blind, then... Jesus would have said that, but he said, no, I'm here to do the works of God because he sent me, and Jesus immediately heals him. That means that the suffering didn't come from God. The suffering came because we're living in a broken world, because there is evil, because there is a devil, and because we are living in a world where there is, unfortunately, a lot of pain. But Jesus said, I came to do works to release people from pain. I came to set people free. I'm here. So the works of God are not the blindness. The works of Jesus are the healing and the miracles. And what he's saying is, don't focus on the problem. Focus on the answer. Now, the other thing that's amazing about this is Jesus is literally fulfilling a prophecy that was given by the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament. I want to show you this. All through the Old Testament, there's promises that God would someday send the Messiah, send his Savior, that he himself would come and he would visit humanity and do a miracle. And in the book of Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 6, listen to this promise. He said, I, the Lord, have called you to demonstrate my righteousness. He's speaking to the, to the Messiah. It's a prophecy concerning Jesus. I will take you by the hand and guard you. I will give you to my people Israel as a symbol of my covenant with them. And you will be a light to guide the nations. What did Jesus say? I am the light of the world. You will open the eyes of the blind. You will free the captives from prison, releasing those who sit in dark dungeons. Now listen to the 35th chapter of Isaiah. Listen to this. Verse 3. With this news, strengthen those who have tired hands 
and encourage those who have weak knees. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong and do not fear, for your God is coming to destroy your enemies. He's coming to save you. And when he comes, he will open the eyes of the blind and unplug the ears of the deaf. This is a promise of the Messiah. But notice who the Messiah is. He's saying he's not just a prophet that's coming to you. He's not just a, an angel in, in, a, in a body that's coming to you. He's saying your God is coming to you. Jesus wasn't just a prophet. He wasn't just a very, uh, very anointed man. Jesus was the fulfillment of God stepping into a human life, stepping into our world, coming to set us free. And he said, say this to people that are tired. Say this to people who are weak. Let this be your encouragement to them. Say to people who have fearful hearts, God is coming to you and he will heal and open the eyes of the blind. Jesus is literally the fulfillment of these prophecies. Hallelujah. He's walking this out even as he, as he walks through the streets of Jerusalem. So don't get hung up on blame. The important thing to know is that our problems are God's opportunities. When we are suffering and hurting, rather than getting obsessed about where did this come from and why is this happening, focus on God's answer. Focus on your future. Just make a decision that you're not going to let the pain and the suffering in your life to consume you. You're not going to be so focused on the past that you can't look up to God and see his miracle for your future. Amen. Amen. Now, the second thing I want you to see is this. We have to allow God to get in the middle of our mess in order for us to experience a miracle. Now, what's amazing about this is Jesus, after, after explaining that it's not about who's guilty, it's about seeing an opportunity for God. Jesus goes on to say, I am the light of the world. I came to bring light to darkness. This man is obviously living in darkness, so I'm going to bring him light. And then the Bible says Jesus does something very unusual. He spits on the ground, and he makes mud. And this is a little gross, you know. And he takes this mud that he turns into clay, and he sticks it on the guy's eyes. Now, this is not the only time that Jesus does a miracle with spit. In fact, there are three examples where Jesus spits and heals somebody. And, you know, we think of spitting on somebody or at somebody, and it's, it would, you know, it's an insult, and, and it, it feels like an insult. But here's what's interesting. To the, to the mind of the Jewish person, spit actually, in the, especially in the, in the Second Temple period, actually was considered to be of healing value, had healing properties. You've heard the term about licking your wounds. There's actually, I just read a study that was released a few years ago that says that they've isolated certain, certain things in saliva that actually has healing properties for skin infections and wounds. So there's a reason for that, but, but, but I, I digress. I just, I just want you to understand, <laughs> Jesus wasn't just naturally healing his blind. How many of you know you can't heal blindness with spit in the natural, right? The, the point is that Jesus is spitting on the ground. Now, now, what I want you to understand is that when he spit on the ground, in, in the minds of the people that were seeing this, spit was like the life force of a person. It represented the heart of that person. And so Jesus is spitting on something that's just the lowest thing, dirt. And it represents something. Now, if you were to go back one chapter, this is the second time in two days that Jesus messes with the dirt. Do you remember when Jesus, we studied a couple weeks ago, when Jesus was tested by the Pharisees as it related to the woman caught in adultery? And they said, what are you going to do? Are you going to stone her? What did Jesus do? He bent over and he took his finger and he began to write in the dirt. Now, this is literally 24, in fact, probably the same day, if anything, within a day. Jesus, now the second time, is bending over and using dirt. Why is that? You see, dirt represents humanity. The Bible says in the book of Genesis chapter 2 that when God made us, he took the dust of the ground and he formed it into a human body and then he breathed into it the breath of his life, his essence, his life force, and humanity was created. 
Humanity is a mixture, this strange mixture of dirt and God. And now we have God in a body, spitting in the dirt and forming mud, just like he did when he made the first mud creature, Adam. And now he's taking it and placing it on his eyes. Now, some scholars have thought that the man was born blind because he didn't have eyes. We don't know that. This text doesn't say it. But the point is that from the time he was born, even if he had eyes, they weren't functioning. They weren't working. They were as good as dead or not there. But Jesus takes mud from his own a mixture of dirt and his own essence and creates something just like God did in the book of Genesis and now puts it on his eyes. What is he saying? Jesus is revealing that he can create miracles, that he can take things that are dead, that are broken, that have never worked, and when God gets involved, he can turn it around. This tells us that God is not this separate, distinct, faraway being who is disgusted with all of our brokenness and pain and sin. God loves us so much that he became a human. He jumped in the middle of humanity. And even with all of our sin and all of our mistakes, Jesus is in the middle. God is in the middle of our mess. He's taking our dirt and he's mixing himself with it. And he can take dirt and his essence and do a miracle. He, can, he wants to jump in the middle of your problem. He's not standing back and saying, do something first. He's not standing back and saying, you must become perfect. He's saying, I want to do a miracle in your life. And whatever your pain or your brokenness might be this holiday right now, I want you to know that Jesus is not standing in heaven condemning you. He's wanting to jump in the middle of your situation. And the thing is, the blind man had to allow Jesus to do this. He had to allow Jesus to put this, this mud, this spit dirt on his eyes. And so he did. Now, the third thing I want you to see is this. Jesus had not yet healed the man. The guy is still blind. And now he's like blind, he's got dirty eyes. <laughs> Jesus gave him a direction. Jesus said, now you go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Now, can I just give you something? <sighs> There's so much in this. I, I, my mind is like going... Tch, tch, because there's so much to say. The pool of Siloam was one of two very important pools in the time of Jesus, and they're both mentioned in the Gospel of John. Remember in John 5, Jesus healed a lame man at the pool of Bethesda. That is just north of God's temple, the Temple Mount. But the pool of Siloam was south, at the bottom of the city of David. And those of you that traveled with us to Israel in January, do you remember walking down the city of David through those, through those tunnels? And we came to that section that was just excavated. They found the, the, the walls of the ancient city of, of Jerusalem. Just, in fact, the very walls that Nehemiah rebuilt, just as the Bible says. And as they were digging around down there, they discovered the pool of Siloam. Many people believed it didn't exist. Many people believed John just made it up. But just as John described it, exactly where it should have been, they found this large pool, massive pool. And the pool of Siloam was significant. It was fed by a spring called the Gihon Spring that was a very, it's, it's still to this day flowing in lower Jerusalem. In fact, it's the reason David could build the city of David there in Jerusalem because it was fed by an underground secret spring. And so in the time of Jesus, they took that spring and they built this large freshwater pool. And at the Feast of Tabernacles, which happened two chapters, the, the chapter before and the chapter before that, every single day, the priests would come and take water from the pool of Siloam. They'd bring it up the steps, probably about a mile, up to the Temple Mount, and there they would use it to celebrate the promise that God would someday bring water from Jerusalem to feed and to, and to replenish the spiritual thirst of the nations. Every day they had what was called the water libation celebration they would take that water and they would pour it out and the people would rejoice and sing psalms that had been happening every day from the pool of siloam now the feast was over it's the next day and jesus tells him to go back there 
Remember, Jesus said that he was the source of living water. And he tells the man to go to that pool. Now, what's amazing is Jesus encountered this man probably about a mile from where the pool is located. That guy was still blind. It almost seems cruel to say to this blind guy, now, go find your way to the pool of Siloam. There's no indication that Jesus helped him or that his disciples helped him find it. He just had to use whatever means he had and find his way to the pool of Siloam with dirt on his eyes that weren't working. But he gets to that pool. This is what's amazing. He gets to the pool and he washes his face and suddenly he can see. God often asks us to do something before the miracle is fully manifested. It's not a work that earns the miracle, but it's a work of faith. You see, the man still had, he didn't heal himself. Walking to the pool and washing his eyes didn't make his eyes open, but Jesus wanted him to participate by faith. And very often when you have a problem you invite Jesus into, a brokenness, a pain, a habit, a sinful situation that you don't know how to fix, you have a sickness, a disease, you've got a problem in your life that is just overwhelming you, very often God will touch your life when you open your life to Jesus, but then you have to take a step of faith. You've got to do something, not to earn God's blessing, but to demonstrate you believe what Jesus has promised. When God told us to, to, to start a church that would bring the, the teaching of the Bible and the, and the presence of the Holy Spirit together in Syracuse, New York, and he gave us this instruction in prayer. He said, get a room, teach the word, the Bible, and I will fill that room. That's all he said to us. We then had to take a step of faith. An angel didn't come down from heaven and lift us up and put us in a room. We had to look for a room, and we couldn't find a room. And, and, and we didn't have any money. And, and so the only room we had was our living room. So we figured, well, that's, that, that, we'll just use what we've got. And so we started in our living room. And, and the three couples came the first service. There was no, no external evidence that there were... There, that anything would happen. There, we didn't have a worship leader. We had me, my guitar, and, and, and a few chords that I knew. And we sang some, I mean, I was, the, led the worship, did everything. There was no, there was, I just had to obey what God had said. I had to take some steps of faith. And as we did, a miracle began to happen. God began to reveal himself as I stepped out in faith. Over and over again, I've seen where the Lord wants us, as we begin to believe him, to take some step of faith. In your life, in your problem, in your mess, you want Jesus to get involved with today. Let me ask you a question. What is the step of faith you can take while you're still blind, while you're still broken, while you're still suffering, while you're still in pain, while you still don't know the reason why it happened? Can you just get past the blame game. Can you get past why or where it came from and just look to Jesus and say, Lord, what is the thing I can do to begin to express, I trust you, I believe in you? It's not because you're earning God's favor. You're demonstrating that you believe his word. Hallelujah. There's always something we can do to demonstrate we trust Jesus. What is he asking you to do? I remember in 2006, God had blessed us, and, and our church had grown, and we were just about to open our new discipleship center, which was a massive effort of our congregation. And a lot of people had expressed their faith and given generously, and we were putting the finishing touches. And on New Year's Eve, my brother called me, my brother Mike, and he said, John, they found a mass on my liver. And all I can tell you is we went into a battle. And for the next four months, while we were supposed to be celebrating the opening of our building, all I could think about was the pain my brother was in. And we fought a good fight, we believed, but the reality is my brother didn't make, didn't win that particular battle. And just a few days before he passed, I was struggling so much with wanting to know why is this happening? Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to us? We'd had some 
difficult experiences in our family, and yet it was happening again. In my mind, I was thinking it's because I have done this wrong, or I don't have enough faith. Or, or, and you know, the reality is God didn't answer me. He didn't tell me this is why this is happening. He just said, listen, I felt the Lord speak to me. He said, I am going to use this, and it's time for your brother to come to see me. Release him to me, and trust me with your future. Well, that was easy to hear, but not easy to do. And so it was a few days before my brother, it really in glory slipped into the presence of God. I was in the hospital room, and this nurse had been there. He'd been coming in and out, taking care of my brother. And this guy was, he, he was a big guy. You could tell he worked out. He was a tough guy. Uh, you know, Nurse Bob. <laughs> nurse Bob was was tough. And he was so attentive to my brother. And I was just just so focused on why this was happening and so hurting. And this guy began to talk to me and said, so you're a pastor? I said, yeah, yeah, I'm a pastor. And he said, so, so you believe in Jesus? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, can you, just, can you just take a moment and minister to this guy? So I turned to this guy and I, I just got my eyes off my problem and why this was happening and all of that. And I just started talking to him and said, yeah. And I just began to inc- just to engage with this fellow. And he said, could you talk to me about what Christians believe and what it means? I said, absolutely. He had a lunch break. I said, let's go to lunch. So we went to King David's restaurant. We were in the Krause Hospital. We walked across the street to King David's. We're sitting there in the middle of lunch, and there's people, you know, all over. And he starts asking me. And as I began to just listen to his heart, God gave me words. And I began to talk to him about how much Jesus loved him, had a plan for his life. And this guy said, can I give my life to Jesus right now? Lord you know, it was part of me like, you know, come to church. We'll give an altar call. And, and, <laughs> and I said, right here? He goes, yeah. I mean, I'm supposed to be the man of faith, right? He's like, like saying, let's pray right now. I said, all right, we'll do it. So we joined hands across the table, and, and I led him in a prayer to accept Jesus as his Savior, open his life to Jesus. And the presence of God came into King David's restaurant. People were watching us. No one cared. This guy is receiving Jesus. And as we, when we said amen, he said, wow, wow. I said, what? He goes, I feel so good. He goes, wow, this really feels good. I just feel forgiven. I feel clean. I said, you are. And it was like a miracle had happened. This guy gave his life to Jesus. And a few days later, as my brother slipped into eternity, I think it was the next Sunday, he shows up in church. And he started coming to church every week. And this guy ended up going to Bible college and studying the word. And, and now he's, he's you know, in another state, but he's living for Jesus and serving God. And I don't understand all that. Why? What happened to my brother? I know this. My brother's with Jesus, and so is Bob. And God took my mess and turned it into a miracle. Don't worry about why your family abused you and threw you in a pit and sold you to slave traders. And don't, don't worry about those who have falsely accused you. And don't focus on those who abuse you. Just realize Jesus loves you. Keep focusing on him. And even if you don't know why, he will give you a miracle in the middle of your mess. What is the step he's asking you to take right now? Would you pray with me? Let's all stand up. If you're watching in Life Chapel, stand up with us. Thank you for being patient today. If you're watching online, we want to welcome you and ask you to pray with us wherever you are right now. Would you bow your heads before the Lord? This Christmas, I believe Jesus wants to be in the middle of your mess. You may not have the perfect family. You may not know how you're going to financially make Christmas happen. You may be so tired of the pressure and the commercialization of this holiday. You just want it to be over. You might be here today and everybody else is saying joy to the world and you just feel like something else the world. You might be here today and you might feel the loss of someone that you love very dearly that's not with you right now. You may be suffering yourself. You may have recently gotten news that is disappointing. You may be struggling with an infirmity. The fact is, all of us are born blind in one way or another. All of us have been broken. But Jesus, right now, wants to step in the middle of our brokenness, in the middle of our mess, in the middle of our mud. 
He wants to put his life into a miracle. Will you open your life to Jesus? Will you let him put his mud on your brokenness? Are you willing to take some steps of faith to trust God? You will not regret it. Would you pray with me right now? Just say this to God. Father, in the name of Jesus, I give my life to you. Lord, take my pain. Take my brokenness. Take the areas of my life that are suffering. Touch them. Give me a miracle. Turn it around. I trust you with my future. I'm not going to blame. I'm not going to worry about where all this came from. But right now, I focus on you. Jesus, I receive you into my life. Into my mess. I receive your miracle. Now show me the steps of faith you want me to take. And I will trust you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen. Praise the Lord. God is good. If you prayed that prayer with me, I want you to know God heard your prayer and God is going to speak to your life. And whatever was wrong with you before we prayed, God has forgiven it, cleansed it, and washed it away. Now take whatever steps he leads you to take. And I want to encourage you to come back and worship with us. Next Sunday, we're going to be teaching in the Word of God again. And then on New Year's Eve, December 31st, a week from tomorrow night, we're going to have a phenomenal New Year's Eve celebration. We're going to come and and have some great things to eat. And then we're going to pray and worship and have a word for the new year. God's going to give us a brand new word for a brand new year. Praise the Lord. I hope you can make it. I pray that you have a blessed and awesome Christmas. May the Lord manifest his miracle in your life. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And may something great happen in your life this week in Jesus' mighty name.